All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Tommy Salmons. He's our something or other fellow at uh, the Institute and hosts a great podcast that we feature there. How are you doing, man? I'm good. And I'm just a fellow. I'm not I'm not a something or another fellow. I'm, a, I'm just a fellow. You can be a fellow. We need a name for that, though. What I'm kind just of some guy, the, the the redneck fellow. The redneck fellow. I think that probably counts for most of us. <laughs> um, all right, Year Zero is the name of the show, and that's not named after Pol Pot and his experiment in communism in Cambodia. That comes from what uh, some kind of tech exploit thing or something like that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was during uh, Vault Seven. I was looking up through looking through the Vault Seven documents, and one of the CIA programs was called Year Zero, and it was mm-hmm. the program in which they could like um, hack into cars and control them, you know, virtually, mm-hmm. like and and stuff like that. And I was like, "That's wild!" So I I just like, yeah, Year Zero. That sounds good because it's kind of revolutionary, and also it it has this kind of like CIA influence to it, which is something I read up on a lot. So I was like, I like it. Yeah, I like that too. And then of course it does like raise the question about Pol Pot and just kind of utopianism and all that, right? I guess as you're saying that revolutionary kind of thing. I well, I think some. I think that uh even even through a libertarian mindset, a lot of that mindset is like becoming a personal revolutionary, right? Like reshaping your own thinking and your own individual responsibility and uh and and taking charge of your own life. So I, I kind of look at that as kind of revolutionary, especially in today's modern world right. where everybody wants to be a um, collectivist. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Right. So so less torturing and murdering people by the millions and more just people get their act together. Makes yeah. Get some sense. chickens. And look, you know what, too, like on a personal level. It's easy to get stuck in a rut, but then it's also easy to say, no, actually, tomorrow's a brand new day. I'm going to change everything if I want to. Mm -hmm. Move to New Hampshire or something, you know? Ah. Hey, so, yeah, speaking of the whole collectivism thing here, uh, I'm interested in your focus here on this corporate communism, ESG. And I think we've discussed this before. It's long been my opinion that progressivism is a right-wing plot. Basically, right, going back to Murray Rothbard and Gabriel Coco and all that, that to stave off the commies, the corporatists bought off the progressives and the labor unions and the sort of softer left. And which is good because we didn't all starve to death under a communist agriculture policy in that sense. But it also means that kind of the the simple dynamic understanding that people have that all the corporate chieftains are all these old rich white right wingers is really not right it is after all the liberal eastern establishment and that's part of the problem now that the liberals cry about is that they're so elitist they're the well-educated well-cultured city seaboard folk that regular people hate their guts and they clearly hate us and so they're you know, they have some ties to the unions and the workers in that sense, lower class or working classes in like through their factory jobs and their unions. But other than that are very, you know, much, you know, if you didn't go to Harvard or Yale with them, then your dirt, you know, is clearly the way that mm-hmm. they see the world, you know. Um, but so, I mean, I guess... My my first question is like, it, is basically all this ESG stuff and all this social justice stuff being adopted by the center left? This is all just essentially like their kind of apology or excuse making to the actual leftists for being such right wing corporate imperialist sellout types. Basically, this is the bone that they're throwing to the left is that 
we'll give you all your racialist kind of uh, cultural communism kind of thing in exchange for letting us continue to be the corporate overlords kind of deal? There, There is an, a, a certain aspect of virtue signaling that's involved with it, like for sure. And and so when, when you hear leftists talk about ESG is not, nothing but virtue signaling, I mean, there there is that dynamic that's that's incorporated in it. But what it actually is is it's regulatory capture in modern terms, right? right. And that and that's what they're doing. They're using modern social sensibilities to to capture corporations and 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 the dollar. And what what has essentially happened? Um, I kind of got a little outline here that starts in 2004. So I'll just run through it real quick. And then after that, I'll, I'll let you uh, comment if you don't mind. In 2004, the UN employed several financial institutions to write up a blueprint of um, sustainable development in a white paper called Who Cares Wins? Connecting Financial Markets to a Changing World. In 2009. And I'm sorry, on, on that one real quick. Who was it that you say wrote that up? It was uh, financial institutions. It was written up by... Um, the the um, like Merrill Lynch and mm. all these financial so institutions it's like PR were, consultants working for these big institutions, right? And the UN hired them to to write it. They gave them the subject. They like we want you to write this. So this was all kind of like the 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 brainchild of the UN and kind of like where they're kind of moving. And we always like <clears throat> a lot of times like with you and I when we're focused on geopolitics, we're looking at. American hegemony, right? Well, what I've come to find out by by reading through these ESG papers and all these white papers, it's not so much American hegemony, it's Western international corporate hegemony that's being institutionalized throughout the world. And and we can we can draw back to uh Perkins but John Perkins book on this, right? Confessions of an Economic Hitman where he talks about how the CIA was basically utilizing corporate interests in order to funnel resources and money from, from third world countries into the United States to enrich the United States and keep these countries under the thumb of the United States. Well, what I've found is it goes beyond the United States. It's more of this, it's more of this um, kind of NGO international corporation, financial institution kind of conglomerate that is working in, in cohesion with the the governments that are then pulling all these resources to themselves to create kind of what people would want to suspect as the the one world government or the new world order you would hear like for shorthand but what it is actually it's this hegemonic world entity that is trying to usher resources to the elites at the top of the financial and corporate institutions at the expense of all the productive class. So, okay. So how does that work exactly? In other words, you're saying that, is it right that, you know, whichever companies are outside basically this is an excuse to to punish whichever companies are outside the regime that they get cut off from resources that get funneled <laughs> just to the higher uh the the biggest pre-existing multinational corporations and such not not just companies but individuals right okay so like we would have to talk about what is the definition of an investor right well, an investor is somebody who's investing capital into uh, a fund in order to get a return, right? So that so that fund, that, that company has a fiduciary responsibility. Well, ESG undercuts that fiduciary responsibility. So you talk about like Merrill Lynch, right? And they have a they have a subsidiary company called Merrill Edge that handles 401ks. On the dashboard of all their 401k holders since 2018, there's been ESG metrics on that dashboard. So basically, the 401k holders, basically your blue collar guys, they're out there working, they've signed up for a 401k, they're investing money, hoping for a retirement plan. And all this money is getting dumped into corporations that are acting against them in the name of, of this corporate hegemony around the world. So In what they words, would do is they, the they would take your are money. picking the investments based on who's checking the right PC boxes rather than on what's a good investment. 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Which so, means that, as you're saying, the the investors themselves are being cheated. They're essentially their money is being put into companies that aren't necessarily returning the best profits, and the people managing their money know it. But that's the rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I looked at my uh, my my company automatically signed me up for 401k. I don't invest my own money, but they invest for me based upon percentages of what I earn per quarter. I looked it up. All my money is going into BlackRock. Uh-huh. Well, BlackRock is is the number one sponsor of ESG, and they control $20 trillion of capital. If you look at like between BlackRock, Vanguard, um, the NGOs like Save the Children, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, the UN, $66 trillion is backing the ESG like structure. And mm-hmm. what it what it is there for, it is there to ensure that the uh, financial institutions are only loaning to the corporate entities, those global corporations that are in the know mm-hmm. and already connected. And so that money is just funneling through from the financial institutions, you know, like the Federal Reserve's printing money, giving the money to financial institutions. These financial institutions are are handing the money off to cor- global corporations. These global corporations are then paying off politicians, right? So there's they're they're undercutting the the blue collar workers, the mom and pop shops, you know, all these entrepreneurs. And ESG just gives them another tool mm-hmm. to undercut all of us. Mm-hmm. And as you're saying too, it's it's funny because I definitely see what you're saying there. We're first and foremost it's a racket, right? Like carbon offsets or any of these kinds of things, right? Where the, the corporation is going right. to exploit whatever the activism is. And right. then second, it's a big PR stunt, pink washing, they call it, right? When the Israelis mm-hmm. do a big gay pride parade and they say, look how liberal we are. Never mind what's going on on the other side of the apartheid wall, right? right. Same thing here with the Lockheed, with their big pink sign at the Lockheed, you know, Equal Justice Pride Month protest that liberals can't hate us you know raytheon it's amazing you'd think it was satire the way they go oh we're the most progressive we you know at raytheon we have the most trans missile engineers out of anybody you know this kind of thing um and then but so and then i'm sorry i spaced out because what was the third thing was beyond it being a racket and 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 oh i know and so first of all it's a racket and and um and you know, is for excluding competition. All this, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. Secondly, it's, it's like PR, the it's like the railroads it's forcing all this woke culture on it's all cartelization. these regular companies, millions of companies out in the country who maybe they don't want to have to go woke. But you're saying this is their only access to <clears throat> to big capital is if they check these boxes, right? So, is there like a, a minimum on that, like with OSHA, where you have to have a certain number of employees before? You like really have to give in to this in order to get a loan to operate and this kind of well, thing. Well, I got an I got a good example for this, right? Okay. Exxon Mobil has a better ESG score than Tesla. Uh-huh. And then, I mean that that gives you like kind of the idea. Gotcha. Like, I read you loud and clear, Tom <laughs> right there. You know. And which Tesla is on welfare, but so's Exxon and and you know. Trade off your your lithium and your and your oil for environmental damage. There, you know, it is a trade off. But you know, Exxon is obviously. Well, I don't know. Obviously, um, and I guess I don't know for a fact that this is still true. But I'm I believe they are still the biggest corporation on the planet. Maybe they're second to Apple now. But they've one, been one of the biggest. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Legendarily, you know, Standard Oil of New Jersey. I mean, <laughs> these guys are the rulers of the world since the big war. Um, so, yeah, uh, and and as far as all of the preening about hydrocarbons in the atmosphere and everything, you'd think they'd be number one on right. the list of bad guys, but yeah. you know they're the ones you know parading around behind all of this uh, PR here. Yeah, they're they're not they don't have enough rainbow colors on their on their flag, so. Yeah, well, they're working on it, I guess. So now, tell us about Klaus Schwab and. You know, there's always been the World Economic Forum has been going on since like the 1990s. It's sort of like the Bilderberg meeting, but on C-SPAN, mm-hmm. right? They'll give speeches and it's sort of the the Western elites building consensus 
Um, yeah. So what is it about this guy, other than his weird clothes and head, that makes him so threatening? He looks he looks like a Bond villain, man. He's like straight out of a movie. <laughs> it's a weird thing, man. It really is. And you but, know, we all but, grew up you on know, movies where all the bad guys have German and Russian accents. Well, he's one of them. What can I say? I, I think that I think okay. So I've read Klaus Schwab's books, like quite a few of them, and, and his writing sucks. And he's writing strictly for for corporate elites, and it's it's terrible, and it's so such a drag to dig into these books his thing is that he's looking for he's he's kind of he's looking for a global consensus right but i don't i don't think i think he's more of a spokesperson like he's just more of the face and as he gets older kind of like george soros as george soros gets older they're their influence is kind of waning and you're starting to see a lot more of Klaus Schwab's right-hand man. You've all know a Harari. Um, and, and one of the things he said is um, that with AI and, and technology moving forward, we're going to have to distract the population through pleasure and drugs. It, it, it's a very eugenic style of mindset. And that's really what freaks people out is they're so open about the kind of the eugenic side of their thought. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's not just the world economic forum. I mean, obviously you know it about Bilderberg, right? But sure. I mean, are, are you for, familiar with the world government summit that started meeting like two years ago in Dubai? Right. Uh, and, and this is made up of like, like um, heads of state, NGOs, corporations, yeah. financial institutions. And they say that their goal is to control 250 countries. <laughs> and it's like, okay, like how can we, how can we paint this any other way? Then it's kind of like your average individual person that's, that's acting in con like in some kind of rational manner for their own lives to move their life forward. And these people with these bigger, broader views trying to push down like this kind of 15 minute city dystopian kind of nonsense on us and put us out of work because we're useless eaters. Right. I mean, I've, I've read several of Klaus Schwab's books. One of the, the common themes through every one of his books, he, he refers to common citizens as little better than, uh, than, um, than pets that have been, you know, housebroken. And it's like, okay, like that's kind of weird. Like we're still people, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, as far as the new world order and all of that, I mean, to me, all it ever meant was, well, not all it ever meant to me, but what it does mean to me now is it's just the American empire. And if you listen to right wingers, they say, you know, this is all a plot against the United States where, you know, what, Russia and China are going to occupy us someday and we're all going to be world communism or something like it's the old John Birch days conspiracy when the Soviet Union still stood. But, mm. you know, what it really is, is it's just like we have with um, the Ukrainian military, it's interoperability, right? <laughs> where it's like this yeah. is they're trying to standardize essentially the american system and then yes that is like in cooperation with western europe and with japan as long as they're cooperative with our goals um to be the global hegemons with you know europe sort of as the junior partner since america has the guns and more money you know usually we got more money sometimes the eu is sort of neck and neck with us but usually we're doing a bit better than them but I don't um, know if I would. Uh, you I don't still know got Russia and China and India, though, who are just massive populations and massive, you know, pieces of Earth mm -hmm. that are just not given into this. I mean, the, you're only ever going to get so much sock puppetry out of Beijing or New Delhi or Moscow. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're never going to have yeah. another Boris Yeltsin there. If we did, we'd be dead before we had a chance to enjoy it because it would backfire that quickly. You know. So I think real world government is a hoax without Eurasia, you know what I mean? And we tried taming Afghanistan and that didn't work. And so, but like, you know, ultimately it's the same old grift though, right? Is just, you know, all these bankers and all these corporations, you know, sucking off of taxpayers, right? Cozying up these, I don't know. You tell me if you know who coined this, because I want to give credit to it. I know I didn't make it up, but whoever said that, the NGO should be called next to government organizations instead of non-governmental organizations. <laughs> I don't like, know that's who what they that. all are, right? They're all just rent seekers 
figuring out what you know how they get paid for not working. I don't know. Like, tell me what you think about this because I've kind of like changed a little bit of my perspective on this American hegemony just through reading all this stuff. I kind of find it to be more of like an international banker hegemony, right? And that it just so happens to be that at this moment in time, the American dollar happens to be the world standard dollar, the currency around the world. And yeah. so that they follow the, the, the they, they kind of like let the American government lead the way. But I really think it has more to do with financial institutions and, and absorbing resources than it does to have to do with governance. Well, folks, sad to say they lied us into war. All of them. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq War I, Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq War II, Libya, Syria, Yemen, all of them. But now you can get the ebook, All the War Lies, by me for free. Just sign up for the email list at the bottom of the page at scotthorton.org or go to scotthorton.org slash subscribe. Get All the War Lies by me for free. And then you'll never have to believe them again. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Let me tell you about Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Who knew? Artificial bank credit expansion leads to price inflation and terribly distorted markets. If you've got any savings left at all, you need to protect them. You need to put some, at least, into precious metals. Well, Roberts and Roberts can set you up with the best deals on silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. And they've been doing this since 1977. Hey, if you just need some sound advice about sound money, they're there for you, too. Call Tim Fry and the guys at 800-874-9760. That's 800-874-9760. Or check them out at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. You'll be glad you did. Well, sure. I mean, well, it's both, right? I mean, did you ever see the Monty Python where the, uh, the old British bank is... Uh, like a ship at sea and the Americans pull up alongside and raid them and, and kind of take over and whatever, you know, this is, yeah. you know, America's the senior partner in the empire. And that's the whole point of NATO, for example, is essentially keeping the Germans in a position where they won't militarize because America guarantees their security, but we get to choose their foreign policy for them too. It's a hell of a compromise that they've made there. I mean, that, they are essentially a satellite, you know, client state in the American empire in a very kind of direct way there, you know. And I guess that maybe is my bias. I look at it first and foremost, like through those military type terms. It's the same situation with Japan and South Korea. You know, we occupy your country, not like, you know, a brutal occupation like the Israelis in the West Bank or something like that, mm -hmm. but... We have our bases there. Well, ask the Okinawans, see what they think. I don't mean to speak for them, but the, essentially we're there at the invitation of these governments. And we have an agreement where we'll decide your foreign policy for you, but you can trust us that we'll keep other people from starting fights with you, you know, right. for, for long periods of time in a row at least. And this kind of thing is a compromise they're willing to make. But then as far as like, you know, you know, you saw, I'm sure you've seen pictures of Prince Bandar bin Sultan's ranch in Aspen, Colorado. Well, we don't have ranches in Aspen, Colorado, right? But <laughs> right. Prince Bandar bin Sultan does, right? So in this sense, and he's the guy who did 9-11 more than, you know, as much as Osama did anyway. You mm -hmm. know, if you want your conspiracy, that's where you go is Saudi intelligence and the Saudi ambassador. Mm -hmm. Not all this missile hit the Pentagon crap, but who put the pilots on the plane that hit the Pentagon? That was always the question. But anyway, mm -hmm. these guys, you know, the, the various uh, dukes and duchesses of Europe, all of the, uh, you know, the biggest multinational corporate uh, you know, shareholders, the bankers, and, and of course, just, you know, as you said, institutional investors, the, the handful of people in the world who literally hold tens or hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investments, you know, or run the firms that hold trillions, as you talked about BlackRock and this kind of thing. When you're that wealthy, of course, do you have you know, it is a, it's a class thing where you have far more in common with other billionaires and and, you know, highest level bureaucrats in 
you know, never mind Europe, but including in Japan and South Korea and and everywhere else too that you know everybody speaks some english or some french or whatever and they all go to these very fancy cocktail parties at these chateaus and whatever kind of deals where the rest of us just have no sway whatsoever we couldn't wait tables in a place like that and um so they all had those places you know very much in common with each other those experiences very much in common with each other, those friendships and, and everything. And they'd never heard of us. You know, I read a thing one time about, uh, I can't have, I don't know who said it, but I thought it was an insightful thing where like, if you took the population of Washington, D.C., most of them have never even heard of Branson, Missouri, mm. where Branson, Missouri is like a huge thing for people in the South. This is like or at least for a long time, I don't know exactly what the status is now, but this is sort of like the entertainment capital of the South. Man, it ain't quite Las Vegas, but it's a special place where people go with their families and see a show and, and you know, have a, a, you know, a vacation spot, this kind of thing. It's somewhat of a big deal in parts of the South where people in D.C. have never even heard the name of the town before, right? It's an entirely right. separate culture from the one where you know but they can be in london in four hours you know in time for lunch and um so part of that is just you know you know there's no escaping it that that's just the way of the world right that's who knows each other is rich and powerful people and um and then you know in that sense and this has been the problem of the state and capitalism all along like you got to hand it to the leftists that they have a lot of good points about the fact that you know capitalism really means a system of state power and when you have you know men and corporations that hold these billions of dollars well then they hold government at their will and they and then the government you know it's just like i learned this as like textbook definition of this the economic system in nazi germany like on an elementary school level uh, or junior high school level was the government controls big business because big business controls government and they like it that way. And this is a mm. marriage here, you know, and obviously in Nazi Germany, Hitler was boss, not Thyssen or whoever. But still, the, the corporations were part of the consensus with the state in that way. And so, you know, in other words, I mean, look at. You know, even the Bushes, right? Like Bush is a bum compared to real billionaires, right? The Bushes, they're kind of an old family, but they're not billionaires. They're just millionaires. You know, they're like skull and bones and kind of go back to the maybe early 19th century, maybe even before that, maybe 18th century. But they are not quite the Abbots or the Pierces or like the very like most powerful old families. You know, they're where Bush would think of like you and me as like the help fit for doing his yard work or whatever. There are people who think of the Bushes that way. Certainly who would think of Obama that way. Remember Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange published the document in the State Department cable where the um, the uh, uh, executive vice president from Citibank, Citigroup in Chicago, names Obama's cabinet. He goes, mm-hmm. here's your cabinet. You're keeping Gates at defense. You're going to make Hillary at state, putting Geithner at treasury, and on down the line. Are you kidding yep. me? <laughs> and I love it. City group says you're going to put Goldman Sachs at Treasury. OK, I see what's going on here. I don't know. I don't think we need secret ceremonies and oaths here. Right. It's just this is big business and big politics and how it's done. You know, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I really believe that that's what the whole war in Russia is about, because Russia is is the biggest country in the world that has resisted international corporations. You know, when they cook, when they kicked out. <clears throat> USAID in 2015, that was a big deal. Yeah. That was a big deal. And people just look over stuff like that. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it was for a good cause, too. They had done a previous round of that in 2011 or 12 yeah. after the snow it was revolution. 2011, the snow, yeah. Yeah, the snow uh-huh. revolution. Yeah. Exactly. And um, now I got all the best guys at my institute. It's great. Um, I mean, people have heard of the Orange Revolution, but who knows about the Snow Revolution? Me and my guy Tommy, that's who. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's it is it's it, and they are relentless. I mean, they're I don't know. This is something I've been working on for the book a little bit. You've probably seen a little bit of this around if you hang on Twitter, where they are talking openly about breaking Russia up into ten countries. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, every ancient kingdom there should be an independent state again. And I personally am not against that other than the fact that we're talking about the American Empire doing it to them. We're not talking about anything like natural you know, secession. capitalism breaking out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Secession to the last man in good in good faith and friendship as people figure out how to prioritize liberty and stuff. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, I, I can see why. The people of Novo, whatever the hell, in central Russia wish that they could go back to the 1300s when they had an independent republic there, whatever the hell. And I could see why even maybe they have a real grudge against the Moscovites. But mm-hmm. I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Having our government being implicated in getting between those kind of groups is, you know, clearly could lead to a nuclear war. And for what? I mean, just to spite their enemies when could just as easily live with them <laughs> it makes no sense right you know yeah it's like a it really is cult-like behavior you know um you, the harder you believe in it the clearer it becomes i guess you know <laughs> um, but right, i think so, it's important that people yeah. recognize that like these these organizations like bilderberg wef um the world government summit all these things these are these are mouthpieces for ngos these are mouthpieces for power, and these these guys aren't acting like Klaus Schwab is not an independent actor. That's not what he's doing at, in that position. Mm-hmm. He's the one who's who's put putting out the talking points, and the books are coming out under his name. But these aren't his ideas alone. I have sure. books in here by other other guys that are involved with the WEF. You all know Harari, where he writes. He wrote a book called Homo Deus where he's talking about how to make men gods. I mean, like the whole idea is just so out of this world, the things that they are experimenting with and want to do in, in in reintroducing kind of that, that eugenics movement and that kind of Malthus Malthusian kind of idea into society. They, they are, they are openly doing this and they are openly advocating for this and talking about this. They're using ESG as a tool to empower themselves and give them the right of passage to incorporate these types of structures. Mm-hmm. And so what, what, what I always tell people is man, find a local credit union, get out of these big banks Find a local credit union, work with them, give them your money, do your loans through them and stop empowering these people that hate you, that openly hate you and are working against you and your well-being. Yeah. Well, okay. so talk about that then. I mean, my local credit union or say the taco stand across the street. Um, there are millions of companies in this country. How afflicted are they all with this ESG stuff? I mean, you have to be what a big grocery store chain that is reliant on on big capital infusions from time to time on some kind of real mid-level or mid to to high a uh, high size company or it's really like every last chicken place is under the boot of this stuff now it's not and, and, and the reason it's not is cuz not everybody is dependent on loans and gifts from from um high society and that's right? really how it's all implemented Right, right. And so so what they're doing is they are withholding loans, they're withholding credit scores, and it can, it, what their plan is to trickle it down to the individual, which is why they're dealing with 401ks. So the plan is to trickle it down to the individual and not allow you to even buy a house without a good ESG score. Now, there have been enough over the last couple of years, there have been enough people in enough states that started standing up, filing lawsuits against banks and and financial institutions, Goldman Sachs and uh, BlackRock, Vanguard. Vanguard even stepped back there for a few months and said, we're not doing this anymore and has kind of been flying under the radar for the last probably four months Mm -hmm. because they were getting hammered with lawsuits from states. You know, I think it was like 19 states filed lawsuits saying you can't discriminate against people based upon their ideological like projection. You Mm -hmm. can't do that. You can't keep people from accessing behavior, right? 
Right. You yeah. can't keep people from like the truckers protest, right? You can't keep the truckers from accessing their money that they earned. It's their money based upon their ide ideological predilections. If you don't want to do business with them, then let them take their money out of the bank, but you can't mm -hmm. shut off their accounts. That's what what's happening with these states, like filing these lawsuits. That's good. Um, un unfortunately, there are still truckers in Canada that cannot access their funds. They cannot get their money. That whole thing's crazy. You know, I heard Bobby Kennedy say, Junior here, say that he was so alarmed by the trucker thing. I mean, first of all, never mind the fact that they're just 100% in the right, these guys. The way they're being mm -hmm. persecuted and all they're doing is standing up for their rights there, you know. And then for the government to be able to turn off their money, you know, that I believe the first precedent with this was PayPal turning off Julian Assange. And it, because mm -hmm. the State Department asked them to, not that right. he had violated the law, but just we really don't like this guy. And yeah. from there, you know, the the camels. Then you had like Sargon of Akkad. I'm sorry. You had Sar then you had Sargon of Akkad with oh, uh -huh. Patreon. And then you had Alex Jones with Stripe. Then Donald Trump, when he got out of office, one of the banks shut his accounts off. Right. Like this has been going on like slowly but surely. It's kind yeah. of like that. First they came for, then they came for, you know, that poem. Yeah. Well, That's look, Bobby Kennedy was, at. he went off about this. He might be the best guy in the country on this or something, considering like, not just, you know, I don't know that he knows the most about it in the country, but in terms of like, he wants to squabble about it right now. He knows a lot about it and he's upset. He said, listen, you know, if they can censor you, like what's going on now, it's a travesty. OK, mm -hmm. but if they can shut off your money, you're a slave. Yep. And he meant it. And he ain't wrong about that. And I saw where, you know, mainstream media liberal type quoted him uh, saying that as though that makes him a crazy person. But no, it doesn't. And, you know, not to invoke the personal, but I happen to know a little bit about the Soviet Union. I already did anyway. But my wife is from there. And mm -hmm. the way it worked in the Soviet Union was as soon as you step out of line, you lose your job, you lose your house, you lose, you know, all of your any health care or any services that you had coming and you are adjourned and you're lucky if you don't go to Siberia. And because the government, the central government controls and owns everything, then you are entirely at their mercy to be able to shut you off. And they can essentially say, yeah, your money's no good here. And not like a friend giving you a free drink, but you are forbidden from buying and selling or from trading within the system at all. And, um, and, and that's that what happened, drew me to, that's what drew me to ESG. It's because I saw the geopolitics in, involved in it, but I also saw the personal involved in it and, and that my parents had 401ks and that this could start infecting and affecting people like me, like the blue collar guy that's just trying to make it through the world and isn't concerned with all this nonsense. They are just working day to day. Yeah. And when I saw the per the way it could affect me personally, I was like, okay, we, somebody has got to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Well, so tell me about, you know, what kind of reaction? I mean, to have state government attorney generals, I guess, or governors suing over this is fantastic that there's already right. that kind of reaction. But can you tell me, first of all, how many states do you know are officially fighting back in that way? And then what what kind of movement out is there out there that's forcing their hand to take that stand? There's about there's between 11 and 19 states that are that are fighting back against this. Um, but let's just take Florida, for instance. Um, DeSantis divested two billion from BlackRock. You know, to, to hurt them and, and, and he does their... do some good things. I have to admit. Yeah, I mean, like for sure, and it, it, not always for the right reasons. Like I listen to like like a Vivek Ramaswamy. He talks about this stuff a lot, right? He started a company called Strive that is is to compete with BlackRock, but not utilize ESG metrics. So if you want to invest in a four hundred one k there's an alternative. So there's this parallel economy kind of thing working on. Doesn't mean I agree with Vivek on everything that he says, but so that's important. Yeah. But, but there are people that are recognizing what's happening and they're, they're taking action to fight against it. Texas is fighting against it. Um, there, there are many there, are, I think Texas, Florida, Utah, 
Arkansas and I want to say Iowa all passed laws that that stated that uh, banking uh, institutions could not discriminate against um, the customers based upon their their political ideas or ideologies. So there are people that are, are taking stands against this and they're doing the best they can. The problem is that this idea popped up in 2004. And here we are in 2021, 2022, 2023, people are just now finding out about it. So we're behind the ball. We're about 15, 18, 19 years behind the ball yeah. trying to fight back on something that already kind of in, in 2021, March of 2021, the SEC um, put together an ESG task force to implement ESG standards on financial institutions and corporations. Mm -hmm. So we're already kind of behind the ball on this. Yeah. Sounds like a lot, but you know, but there, I mean, but if you look at like what's going on with Bud Light, you look at what's going on with like target. That's and I kind of this, say, man. There's, there's yeah, a lot you're of right wing reactions. Kind of, you're getting kind of these spurts of like people recognizing, hold mm -hmm. on. Like this, this stuff doesn't have to be in our daily lives. Like Colin Kaepernick kneeling, uh, during a football game was one thing, but now you're, you're have these like satanic nun transgender people at a, at a baseball game. Like what the hell's going on? So people are starting to it wake is. up like and South say, Park, like, man. why That's is this great. shit? Like yeah, exactly. It is. It's idiocracy or South Park. Like it's just insane. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, to paraphrase poor old dead Bill Hicks, completely out of contest. A lot of people are feeling that right wing reaction right now. <laughs> like, I mean, for me, I know what I believe and and uh, it's it's not so easy to, you know, really uh, change my mind about stuff. Um, but I uh, I certainly, you know, I guess I sympathize with other sides views more or less strongly at different times. And I can certainly see why, geez, if I'm feeling this right wing right now, just imagine how right wing the right wingers are feeling when, when, <laughs> yeah. when there's no reason for them to deny it and not just go for it. You know, I, right, I still got exactly. my problems, man. I got, I got things about the right that ain't libertarian enough, but if, if that wasn't my problem, geez, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, I could see, and, and, you know, even Fukuyama says in the end of history that, you know, look, liberal democratic capitalism and, you know, regular elections, little d democracy, more or less along American lines is the wave of the future and is going to be, is mostly right. I mean, who can argue that, no, we rather really have kings than regular elections. Or we'd rather right. have a military dictator than a regular election. Like, sure, we'd rather have anarchy and peace, but that's not really one of the choices, right? right. Or, <laughs> or who thinks that we should have socialism or fascism instead of market capitalism and property rights? The you know, problem is we don't get libertarianism. We get this, this weird, twisted kind of horror movie neoliberalism. It's kind of funhouse mirror version of what we believe, you know. But anyway... Point is, have and, you ever, um, uh, and I guess read, Fukuyama uh, says it, there's still all of this ethnic and religious and cultural and historic right wing identity out there in the world that's mm. just not going to stand for being completely steamrolled by this brave new world, you know, and that maybe in America. The the corporations and, and Silicon Valley and Hollywood just rule. But there's so many places in the world where people just have higher priorities than doing what the hell they're told by the likes of us. You know, it's always and I think that that's true in America, too, where you can only push so much, especially cultural change on people at a time before, you know. I mean, if I'm sitting here thinking, man, I might start going to church just like because I resent these leftists. Not that I believe in Yahweh one bit more than I ever did, but like just because I'm so mad at them, like maybe there is something to these right wing cultural, like more conservative. I should say right wing, but more conservative cultural traditions that I should tap into, like just like 
to spite them, maybe, you know? I don't know. I know a lot of people are feeling that way, too. Who wants to be bossed around by Klaus Schwab? Who the hell does he think he is? <laughs> what army does he really control, anyway, you know? Although, help me out with this. I'll, I'll figure out something useful to say here in the form of a question. Where the hell did BlackRock get $8 trillion or get control of, what, $20 trillion worth of capital assets and resources and this, that, whatever, whatever, BlackRock and Vanguard. I mean, I know that obviously Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and the rest have handed it to them, that they get the Cantillion effects, these biggest, most powerful firms. But can you, like, walk me through how it was that these I'd tell you exactly how firms they did it. especially I'll tell came you to exactly, dominate? Exactly. i tell you exactly how they did it. They are um, top financiers and investors in every major corporation coca-cola pepsi goldman sachs um merrill lynch they they have their hands in everything if you go look at the top investors of any corporation you're going to find blackrock up there that's how they did it they've turned all of that into power they they probably started with one and then bought another and then it's kind of like that, that there must that be good old, books uh, about that some crazy like badass wall street journal reporter must have written that book or something right it's kind of it, well it's kind of like the rothschilds right they they finance both sides of world war one right it's kind of like that whole idea it's like either way we win it doesn't yeah. matter who wins we win and that's that's how they did it but you brought up you brought up Fukuyama. You know what it reminded me of? It's James Burnham's Suicide of the West. Have you ever read that? Nah. You've got to read that book. I always I read Rothbard about how much he hated James Burnham and I that I, I, I read the curious, I read the Machiavellians. I've I've read a couple of his books. Suicide of the West, I guarantee you, when you read that and you look at what's going on around us, you'll be like, this dude was on point. He was way ahead of his time. But he was on point because everything you see and he talks about the degeneration of liberalism and how it's a, a constant movement forward and it has to lead to progressivism, has to lead this. But it's all the same thing. It's all liberalism and it's all coming from the same route. And it just has no choice but to continue. This snowball has to continue rolling downhill. Hey, guys, Scott here for Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego at JewelryStoreSD.com. They do business nationwide. They sell jewelry and watches, specializing in engagement rings. You know, in case you're in love with somebody. They also specialize in one-of-a-kind vintage and antique jewelry, fully serviced pre-owned fine watches, such as Rolex, Patek, Philippe, Cartier, and any high-end brand. Leos also services high-end watches faster and cheaper than going to a factory service center. Leos takes all the stress out of shopping for jewelry and engagement rings, and always at the right price. They deal nationwide over the phone, at 619-299-1500. That's Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego. Go to JewelryStoreSD.com to check out their fine selection and to find out more. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's ScottHortonShow.Substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? ScottHortonShow.Substack.com Hey y'all, LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you Ammo.com for all your ammunition needs too. That's LibertasBella.com Well, and uphill in a lot of ways too, I mean... <laughs> You know, again, you know, liberalism, you know, our current neoliberalism, it is the bastard version of libertarianism, right? It's sort of after the New Deal, they kind of moved back to the right a little bit, right? And so it was like the compromise is sort of the corporate compromise with New Deal welfare statism. And so, and then... Yeah, in the compromise, see, this is the problem, especially, right, is the liberals have no devotion to free market theory in the way a libertarian does. So their commitment to capitalism amounts to really just selling out to corporate America and becoming, you know, most importantly, and probably first and foremost, imperialists. Because you always have these big corporations that have, you know, major 
uh, issues of protection in foreign nations need friendly governments overseas and all these kinds of things. So, and I, then I would, all those weapons, all those big ticket ships and bombers, man, all that money. I often wonder though, is, is there, is there, can there be a free market capitalism as long as there's corporatists and, and elites that are, are, you know, playing or, or bending the field, the rules to their. No. I mean, I think you can't. I mean, this is why Rothbard, I think, or one of the reasons he was an anarchist, because this is what convinced me to be an anarchist. Is like, I, I gave up on the idea of limited government. That is, you could say you hate the Federal Reserve all you want, but it was the Congress that created it. So get rid of the Congress. But ultimately, you know, not that I'm saying I want to only have a president without a legislature. So, <laughs> but, but the thing is, so what are you going to do if, you know, I'll tell you what, this reminds me of an argument I got in in 1999 with a black bloc anarchist, revolutionary commie, uh, syndic anarcho syndicalist, he called himself at Free Radio Austin. And I told him, come on, man, socialism with a police force is communism, you know? And he goes, yeah, but capitalism with a police force is fascism. And I says, you got me. <laughs> you know, touche, <laughs> dude. That's right. You know, minarchism is bullshit. That, you know, ultimately, um, if, you, if you have a state, um, again, capitalism, depending on who you're talking, right, to a libertarian, that just means private property rights and free exchange. Shut up, commie, you don't know. But to the commies, they know what they mean when they say capitalism means the system of state power that you live under, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we're, and this means the people who own the capital get to call all the shots for how the state acts, which is yep. right and is not fair, you know? Um, but then... You know, the the Democratic alternative of just voting harder to have government check that power a little bit, I think this is why I'm a libertarian. I, always, I think that that's the fool's errand, right? Is that's, uh, you know, embracing, um, it, um, like, that's Philip Drew's recommendation. That's what Colonel House wanted us to do. You know, you're right. <laughs> the corporations are evil. We should get, pass a progressive income tax and a central bank and get into a world war. That'll show them, you know, and this is, yeah. you know, that's, that's what why That's why we gave is. them personhood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, so we're screwed. I mean, that's the problem is you got to get rid of the state. You can't get rid of private property rights and free exchange, so you got to get rid of the state. You know, um, which is a hard row to hoe, but point being, you know, the less of it, the better. I saw Nick Gillespie. I, I can watch the whole thing. They interviewed him for like two and a half hours or something. I'm not watching that. But um, Reason interviewed um, Robert Kennedy and he says, look, I just don't think libertarianism works for the commons. And Gillespie's like, yeah, but so shouldn't we be privatizing all the commons then? If economics say that people just devour the commons without regard, then... And, and economics teaches us that when somebody owns something, they'll take better care of it so they can sell it for a higher price later, this kind of thing. And it's like, go Gillespie! Yeah, man! Just like basic <laughs> kind of free market insight for you here, Kennedy, you know? Um, <laughs> but, you know, he is a Democrat. He's not one of us, but... Yeah, you know. I mean, you, you can't expect any of these guys to be perfect. That's the, that's the one that's thing we true. have to always recognize. It doesn't matter which one we're looking at. None of them are perfect. Well, tell me what you think of Bobby Kennedy. I, you know, you and I had this conversation. I, I, I like him. I tend to like him. I tend to think he's a genuine person, which for me is very important. If somebody's genuine, I, I, I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt, even if I disagree with him on some things. There are things I disagree with him on. Um, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous that he keeps getting hammered about um, his stance on vaccines and this, that, and the other. And no matter how many times he answers the question that um it, it's not good enough so yeah. i i i think he's i think he's a decent i think he's a good person you know i had this conversation with my dad that my dad said all all the kennedys that have run for president seem like they're good people but they have a tendency to get killed so um there's that but yeah i think he's a good person i i don't i don't think i think he's a genuine guy but you know i mean he's a politician yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, I I'm 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 real southern. I you know like fuck 
the government and that's about it like yeah like whatever <laughs> i feel you. i don't yeah. i don't think much about these people i pay a little bit bit of attention to see what's going on um i trust kennedy more than i trust DeSantis. yeah me too i don't trust DeSantis at all but you know um and look, Kennedy, you're right. He is a politician. And, you know, we caught him today saying some politician-y things about, you know, he told us at Porkfest, look, I'm not going to take your guns. The courts have ruled. The Second Amendment is broadly interpreted. And I'm going with that. I'm a Bill of Rights guy and uh, promise I won't take your guns, you know. And then he sat down and did some town hall thing. He said, well, you know, if they pass the assault weapons ban, I'd I'll sign, sign it. it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but then, to be fair, though, he said that I, I only read this in the summary. I didn't watch this part of the interview, but I did see in the summary of the Reason magazine interview that he said both to them. Like he wasn't trying to be coy to them. They're they're libertarians and he knows that. And he said he told them, one, I won't take your guns, but two, if they pass an assault weapons ban, I'll sign it. So I don't know how much of a fight um Zach Weissmuller and um Nick Gillespie put I, up when he said that, but at least, you know, officially uh, I think he was trying it to caveat like he was, it. It by sounds like maybe he just it adopted his he adapted his position and now is sticking with his new story rather than just telling people what they want to hear, which was my initial interpretation. <clears throat> but if he was that if he was that honest to Gillespie, then that at least speaks <clears throat> to what you said about his genuineness a little bit, rather than that kind of shiftiness. But you know, he said too about Free Ross. She asked him, uh, Carla uh, Gerke asked him about uh, Free Ross at um, Pork Fest, and he goes, "Yeah, once I'm sworn in, then I'll look at it." You know, which mm, is a nice yeah. way of saying I am not looking into it and <clears throat> just taking out a position on it that I'll have to defend between now and then, which is. Right. You know what? I don't know, man. I guess that's fair that he didn't have to take a position on every damn thing, especially every libertarian's pet issues. But it, it did smack of like a little bit of like, I don't like craftiness, man. Give me Ron Paul. I don't know how to be crafty. I only know what to tell you that I feel is true kind of truthiness, dude. That's what I, I want, did. You know, I did watch his interview on um, I did watch his interview on breaking points and he did the same thing to them. So it might hmm. just be like issues he's just not um, focused on at the moment. Because he's got a year. She, we'll see how she, it goes. You yeah, know. she she asked him about. Um, oh shit! What was she asked him about? I think she asked him about health care. And he was like, "Look, he's like the, the we're not in a position to do Medicare for all. Even if like even though I think it might be a better option, what we have to do is put ourselves in a position." Like, and so I'll have to sit down uh, and look at that. And then the dude on there asked him about taxes. He's like, I haven't really felt like come up with a like consistent tax policy. I really have to kind of look at it. And so that's kind of one of his things that actually makes him sound more human. Is it's yeah, like I the I don't know aspect. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, we'll see. We'll, we'll look into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, he seems like a, a decent dude. I, I guess I don't, my thing of it I don't is have this. a strong opinion on him. I'm just like, he's interesting. I, yeah. I find him interesting. Well, look, like, I mean, I, yeah, my take is, I mean, what the hell? It doesn't matter what I think as far as like, you know, I'm obviously not going to support any Democrat for anything ever. You know what I mean? I'm a Ron Paul guy, dude. I'm And I'm not very likely to budge on that kind of a deal at all. So I, I look at it where, like, you know, whether I support him or not is, like, not even the question. Of course I don't support him. But I'm very interested in, and excited about the um, implications of his run. Right, yes. Because, you know, he's not on a scale of one to Ron Paul. He is not as honest as my man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we talked yeah. about, there is that little bit of politicianiness that we can kind of already see there. On the other hand, on the scale of one to everybody else here, he is Ron Paul grading on a curve, you know, yeah. uh, and just in terms of honesty. I mean, not his every position, but just in terms of being telling the truth, being brave, in, in fact, in telling the truth about very mm -hmm. controversial things. And... 
running as a Democrat against a very weak president who could drop yeah. dead at any day, whose vice president is 100% unanimous consensus unprepared to step into his shoes when the most talented, handsome, hair-having governor that they have to run is Gavin Newsom, the guy that ran California into the ground and was almost recalled, only the Republicans didn't have anybody good to replace him, but he's complete scum. I mean, they lost a congressman because so many people moved out of California under his lockdowns. And that's all they've got. And then here's this guy and his name ain't Paul. When Ron first ran in 2007, nobody ever heard of this guy. I mean, there was one guy in every neighborhood who loved him and mm. was raring to go, right? But the, va- the, 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 the culture had never heard of him before. The people had never heard of him before, um, which is so unfair and wrong and sinful itself. But anyway, this guy's a Kennedy, and he ain't Ted Kennedy's son, you know, all fat and dumpy Mm. and stupid. Right? He's Bobby Kennedy's son. He's very charismatic. He looks 10 years younger than his age. He's 69. Looks like he's 59. Mm. I sat at a table with him, and I saw all the 40- and 50-year-old ladies they love him, man. They think he's just great. Oh, yeah. And so, like, he's got, you know, um, he's got charisma, real, you know, uh, magnetism and charisma. Of course, he's got the voice problem, but that seems to be getting better and better. Um, he said he, he had a surgery, though. Yeah, he has some in, surgery. In Japan. It used to be quite a bit worse. Um, but the thing is... Um, you know, he has to split that difference. He's got to figure out how to be, you know, royalty and also a traitor to his class at the same time and and take our side against the rest of them. So hard difference to split and, and keep people happy on both sides of that, you know. Um, but it just seems like his potential to uh, to run away with at least some real support, I don't know about the nomination, maybe even the nomination, um, is very real. And it's not like with Donald Trump where they deliberately promoted him for a year because they thought he'd be the easiest to beat in the general. right? So they supported him up until he got the nomination. Then they all turned on him for half a year up until the election to try to rig it for Hillary. In this Mm. case, we don't have a Pied Piper thing. So they're just coming out all guns blazing, right? NBC, New York Times, Atlantic, New Republic. You must hate and fear this guy. And and so early, like, it just seems like they're swinging and missing. Like, people haven't even had a chance to hear him yet. And But they're being told, oh, he's so right-wing and he's so evil. And you know what? Center-left liberal Democrats are so goddamn dumb these days, man, that, like, <laughs> maybe they'll just believe it. I saw somebody posted a poll, said his approval rating among self-identified liberals and progressive Democrats is plummeting because he's being identified, you know, as a right-winger. Um Because he's talking to right-wingers, basically. Um, And because he's not spouting a bunch of woke platitudes. But clearly he's a liberal. I mean, he does talk, maybe he should talk more, but he does talk about the welfare state and about homelessness and paying poor people's medical bills and this and that. I don't know about Medicare for all and whatever, but he's clearly not a libertarian when it comes to the welfare state or the regulatory state. You know, he's not a leftist or or a progressive. I mean, he is a liberal in the sense that he believes in capitalism. And not any kind of socialism, but, well, I shouldn't say any kind of socialism, but he is very much for, like, the welfare state for the poor, food stamps and and social security and and medical care and help for the orphans and, you know, whatever, all that kind of crap. So Mm -hmm. he really should probably emphasize all that more. Um, to show that like he really is not a right winger, but they are already just knives out for the guy. But it just seems like, okay, so I read the NBC hit piece on him today. Was it NBC? I think so. And it's just so over the top. They try to make him sound like he's Alex Jones, mm. but he's just not. Like you could say, oh, geez, I think he like goes a little too far about vaccines or whatever. If you're one of those people who thinks that about him. But to call him, like, leader of the truthers is not true. 
There's, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's not another like major truther story that he's <clears throat> out in front on on anything this whole time. You know what I mean? He's not a 9-11 guy. He's not a, you know, I don't know, whatever's supposed to be a conspiracy. He's not a big Benghazi guy or a big, you know, New World Order guy. Um, so, you know, they try to portray him that way. But I think, like, my auntie and your auntie could just be like, I don't know, he seems all right to me. You know what I mean? Like, who are you going to believe, me or your own lying eyes? When they're just, right. they, they go, this guy's a lunatic. And he's like, look, all I think is that after reading 17 books and writing three, that I think we should be careful. <laughs> and they're just like, I don't know. It <laughs> kind of sounds reasonable. Sounds like be careful is right. I don't know if you saw the clip where a pediatrician confronted him about vaccines at that town hall. And he started talking, and the guy's like whole body language changed and everything. Like, oh damn, you really know what you're talking about, and I'm yeah, really I learning saw, some I things. And like, man, is that really true about the chickenpox vaccine? I really need to look into that. And all, you know, you see, it's written all over the guy's face. I'm like, ah, oh, geez, okay, well, maybe. Remember maybe when they used to have chickenpox parties? They wanted you to get chickenpox. Yeah, because nobody was dying of it. There were <laughs> there were kids that did that, and well, some kids, you know, it was very rare, but some kids did die of it. In fact, my mom told me a story. Of, she asked my pediatrician whether that she should do that because some of the kids in my neighborhood did that, yeah. and she, and she asked, and he said no because even if it's a one in a five hundred chance or less or whatever. Yeah. If you if you do that and your boy dies, you'll never forgive yourself that you did yeah. it deliberately. And you know what? He's going to get chicken pox anyway, this filthy little runt. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Which, in fact, I, that's wasn't the one true. thing I, I didn't never get it. got. I didn't get it until 2017. I never got it. I never. I have never had chicken pox. Raised five kids. I'm fo- almost yeah. 44 years old. You must, never had chicken pox. <laughs> must practice great. Hygiene. And I didn't get a vaccine either. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, well, stay away from this Klaus Schwab guy. He'll stick you with a needle. Um, all right. Well, listen, I guess we should probably let people off the hook here. But um, uh, I think I d- neglected to say the name of your great article at the beginning of the interview. It's at the Libertarian Institute. It's from a year ago. It's called ESG, The Threat to Liberty You Haven't Heard Of by Tommy Salmons. And it's really great. He's got all kinds of great links and all kinds of in-depth information for you in there. It's a great primer to get started on the subject if you're interested. And, of course, go to the Institute and subscribe. There's We got one feed that's all of our shows combined together, or you can pick and choose. And if you do so, you should definitely pick and choose and sign up for Tommy's podcasting year zero, which is awesome. And uh, with that, thank you. And have a good evening. Appreciate you, brother. Yeah, oh, yeah, you too. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.